Thank you, Julian, everybody. Thank you. We'll come back and sing that one again before we leave today. Would you take your copy of the scripture and open it to the book of Psalms and Psalm number 33? In a few moments, we'll, we'll talk about that which is on the graphic above you, the coming outpouring, the coming outpouring. But before we get there, I, I, some things in the light of this week and in the weeks and months, even years preceding this last Tuesday, some things I feel like we need to remember, we need to acknowledge, we need to thank the Lord for, and we need to declare our trust in Him as we as we go from here into the next, the next four years. This is Psalm 33, verse 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. That means reverence, respect, obey. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Mark verse 10, the Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men from his dwelling place. He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all, he who understands all their works. The king is not saved by a mighty arm. The warrior is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a false hope of victory, nor does it deliver anyone by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, who reverence him, who trust him, who seek to obey him, on those who hope for his loving kindness to deliver their souls from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart rejoices in Him because we trust in His holy name. Let Thy loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us according as we have hoped in thee. Would you look again at verse 10? The Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the people. He frustrates the plans of the people. He frustrates the poles of the pollsters, excuse me. Against all odds, there was the man named Donald Trump and the party with which he is represented that were given, in a, in a sense, again and again and again, no chance of what happened on Tuesday, it continues to happen. For us to say that Donald Trump would represent what we've come to sense is more of the heart of the Lord for the nation, certainly for the unborn Americans, that he represents and that party represents more of the heart of the Lord than the other party and its platform, is not to say that a man is all of a sudden the savior of the nation, or that he is perfect in every way, 
that he can answer every question, solve every problem. But it is to say that the Lord has a way of picking out ones that will represent her heart, though, though the vessel is flawed and the wrapper can be difficult to take. But he still chooses men, he still chooses women to accomplish his will and his purpose. For that, for that, the most underpolled or never polled, yet potentially the most powerful minority in the nation, the followers of Jesus, have found ourselves at a place of saying, Lord, we understand it's not a man that is our Savior. You are the one who will rescue this land. You are the one who will rescue our families and our cities just as you have brought rescue to our hearts individually. Our trust is in you. But we are asking you, we are trusting you, and this has been the prayer of millions across this land over these last weeks and months and even years, particularly weeks and months. Lord, deliver us from the evil one. What you call evil, deliver us from that. And I think that a big portion of why there can be rejoicing, why there can be a sense of relief coming out of Tuesday and into this moment is that there is a sense that legally by the vote of the majority of Americans, there is to a degree and in specific ways a pushing back of the will of Satan, Satan against this nation and the opportunity for that which is the heart of the Lord to be more freely expressed. 312 electoral votes to 226 electoral votes. Overnight, the last of what was considered the blue wall turned red. Arizona. All seven. All seven. All seven. Now again, you, you, you must understand the heart of the followers of Jesus. We are not by definition Republicans or Democrats or Independents. We are by definition the followers of our King. What pleases Him what pleases him transcends every ethnicity, transcends every political party, transcends every geographic location, transcends all things economic. It's what you want, Jesus. Nobody else loved me enough to know what you were getting when you got me, and knowing that you took my sins you took the things that broke your heart, that wounded you, my sins, and you nailed them to your body on that cross. And because you paid for my freedom with your death, you are my Lord, you are my King, you are the one that I honor above every other part. Now I pray that as you grow in your walk with the Lord. The tug at your emotions and the, the sense of pulling you into a way to think which results in a way of voting and acting. When it is people, no matter who they are, what their last name is, when it is people more than your Savior, you will find yourself as time goes on being less and less and less obligated this way. Your heart shifts. Your heart shifts into, Lord, I want my life to please you. I want my choices to please you. I want the words that come out of my mouth 
to please you, Jesus, Jesus. So when there is a vote that the followers of Jesus are to make on whatever the situation would be, again, I'm saying to you that the pollsters and the political talking heads just miss it if they try to put us in one particular category and forget that our allegiance is not anywhere this way, but our allegiance is this way. Uh, you know, they, 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 somewhere along the line, maybe one day, some of these really smart pollsters will, will think, you know, maybe we better ask these ones that call themselves the followers of Jesus how they're praying. <laughs> how they're praying. I said a minute ago that the most potentially powerful minority in the United States, which we pray will not always be a minority, but we're not talking about people who go to church. We're talking about followers of Jesus, all right? And, and it's a minority, but we're believing it's, 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 it's growing. And this, this coming outpouring of the Spirit we trust will ex expand that. But when, when, when the church, and that's what's been going on, folks, in these, in these last several months, there are millions, there are millions of brothers and sisters in Jesus, just like you, just like us, who have found themselves concerned, burdened, thirsty, thirsty for there to be a change in our nation, and so they've been praying. But here's the part, just like you've heard us say, almost ad infinitum, ad, in, ad nauseum around here, that it's understanding of who you are in the sight of God that you're not a stepchild, you're not just an accident to the family. You were picked out, chosen, wanted, with heaven's designs upon you before you were ever born. And as time went on, we came to, into that realization of who Jesus is and his love for us. And we opened our hearts up to him. And as a result, we have received him as our Savior and as our Lord. And he is, he is gathering us as he owns more and more of the insides of us, the heart of us. We're more and more into a relationship with him. But we also are understanding who we are in the sense that <laughs> he is saying to us. And this is, I believe this is a truth that millions of brothers and sisters in America, it's settling in on them. When Jesus said, here is how you to pray. I am not giving you a list of requests to make. I am giving you a series of commands to give. Come kingdom of God. Be done will of God on this earth as it is in heaven. Deliver us from the evil one. There has been a, there has been a weak, diluted operation of what prayer is in the body of Christ that is being changed. It's being dramatically shifted. Wait a minute. We're not supposed to come into the presence of the Lord as if we've got to beg entrance and Jesus has already been, he's our high priest. We're coming to him. And we're on this earth. Now, my brother, my sister, I pray you'll get this. And there are millions just like us around this nation. And I believe that is why there is further force to the prayers of the church than maybe there has been in a generation or more. It is that he has said, this is what you're to say. Not ask for the kingdom of God to come. You call it forth. Come, kingdom of God. What is that? It's the presence of the king. It's the pleasure, what pleases the king being done, being implemented in the situation in a life. And it's the power of the king. So when we're praying across the nation, come, kingdom of God. <laughs> We're saying, Lord Jesus Christ, make your presence, your presence known in this nation. 
Not that some new building is going to be built or new, some new denomination is going to be built. The presence of Jesus, the presence of Jesus, the presence of Jesus, the presence of Jesus. As the church across the nation, the followers of Jesus, millions, I believe, have been praying along those lines, it, it, it is going way farther than just last Tuesday. Way more than a particular party or a person. But is Lord the only hope, the only answer for that which is deeply wrong and deeply divisive in this nation? The only hope is Jesus. The pre- I can't believe I said that and y'all didn't holler back at me. I'm going to say it again, and I'm expecting you to say something. All right? The only hope for this nation is the presence of Jesus coming. All right, see, see, the reason that's so important is you, you gotta, we, we got to lose that it's just going to church. That it's just the approval of a pastor or a priest or a whatever. No power in that. No power in statues, no power in art, no power in buildings, no power in human structure. There is only power in the name, in the person of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, where you found yourself, where you found yourself not quite as attracted, not something, why aren't you going to church? Why, if the church you've been going to has caused you to lose sight of Jesus, quit going there. Find another place to be. Get underneath an oak tree somewhere with your Bible open. Sing Amazing Grace and you'll feel His presence right there. I mean that. Now you can understand why I've gotten chunked out of a number of churches for saying such things. There's no power in the building. There's no power in the instruction other than that which will direct to the person of Jesus. Now that, that's what's happening, folks. That's what's happening in this nation. Followers of Jesus by the hundreds of thousands, independent of the pressure from denominations or specific leaders, just because that's working in their hearts. The burden for the nation, but then connecting with other brothers and sisters with a like heart but also realizing that it's got to be more than the, who's elected for the next two years or four years on the soul of the nation, on the heart of rebels, on the heart of unbelievers, on the heart of the, the helpless and the hopeless, when they just get visited by the presence of Jesus, anything can happen in their lives. Anything can happen in their lives. When you get thirsty for a demonstration of the power of God, He will not disappoint you. And that's why there's hope coming out of this. I'm I'm, I'm appreciative of who was elected because there seems to be, as I've said, more of a sense of a heart for God and what pleases Him than another party. But where there is this sense, it's gathering It's stirring two or three hundred thousand women, mainly women, just a few weeks ago in Washington, D.C., on the mall. They prayed, and we had some of our folks there. They prayed, worshiped, confessed from nine in the morning, nonstop, until seven in the evening. There were no food trucks, there were just water stations. And they praised, and they repented. And there were folks from various lifestyles, various backgrounds who, who, had, who had given themselves and been a part of things that, that they've come to realize now are just, are, are just completely not the heart of God. And there is another way. There is freedom. And they were given testimony of the power of Jesus to set the captives free. There are prayer groups numbering the hundreds of thousands online. And some of you are Many of you probably are part of those, and you're keeping up with well, how do we need to pray, and what are the things that are, that are being rejoiced in, and what are comments that can help in our directing. There, there, is a, there is a networking of things that are happening right now 
that I believe are the precursor for the coming outpouring. Back in the summer, when, when we were in Montana, I, I had done a little bigger, little bit dig, deeper digging into some history, some history of the Hebrides revival, 1949 to 1952, an island or a series of islands off the coast of Scotland. There were two little old ladies, all right, in their 80s. Some of you will remember this, but the reason I'm repeating it. One of them was blind, and the other one could hardly walk because of arthritis. In their 80s, and they developed, they felt God had given them this incredible this, this burden. They couldn't shake it, burden to pray for revival, specifically for the young people on the islands because they just seemed to have no heart for God, no heart for the things of the church or the things of the Lord. And, and they were burdened. Here, here, we're getting old enough. We're going to be leaving here. Somebody needs to catch this that we have the burden for. And so they began to just pray, Lord, send revival. They invited church leaders from the area. It's a smaller community, smaller area, to come to their house because they were too incapable, too, too unable to, to get to the church building. So here came these people trying to honor, I guess some of them first would be, be nice to these little old ladies, <laughs> have an art for prayer. And they came and they met and they began to pray. A Scottish preacher by the name of Duncan Campbell was invited to join in the praying, but also to be there to preach from time to time. Duncan Campbell gives numerous accounts of how an amazing answer to prayer little bitty house, little bitty stone house, not, not going to have any ability to impact a broader world, just maybe something in their village might happen. But he began to describe how in answer to prayer, amazing things were happening. That, that all of a sudden, young people, instead of lining up to go to the races or whatever they're going to, they, they began to be turned and trying to find a way into the church, into the church building, middle of the night, things like that. <laughs> Revival swept the Hebrides, swept Scotland, swept the UK, spilled over and went literally all around the world where the church would hear, believers, followers of Jesus would hear about that and would want to know more about it and begin to pray, Lord, do that here. And he would do it with fresh revival, fresh power, fresh wind in places all around the world. One of the teenagers who were a, was a part of that was a young man by the name of Donald Smith, 15 years old. He became, he came to know the Lord. He was saved during that, but then there just came to be a passion in his heart to want to be all that the Lord wanted him to be. And he was at the, at the very center of that moving of the Spirit in the Hebrides revival. Some years before, a cousin of his, a niece to these two older ladies, had migrated to New York. And she began to work wherever she could find work, as a housekeeper, as a maid in New York City. As time passed, she eventually ran into, met and fell in love with a young man by the name of Frederick Trump. Frederick Trump. They married, and they had five children. The fourth child was a son, and she named that son after her cousin, who was integral to the Hebrides revival. She named that son Donald, Donald Trump. All these years passed, Donald is out chasing whatever he was chasing for all those years. But that then there came a time where it seemed as if 
his life, his world was getting more focused and it had something to do with this nation. Entered politics, was elected in 2016, and he laid his hand to take the oath of office on the Bible of one of those great aunts from the Hebrides revival. Now let me give you the verse of scripture that they prayed as a part of believing, promise the Lord's promise to send revival, to send awakening to the place where they were. And it's this one, just one verse out of Isaiah 44, verse 3. And this is how they prayed. This is what these two older ladies believed the Lord by His Spirit had written across their hearts to believe Him to do. For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. That's what they took to mean as a promise that the Lord had a heart for the next generation, the younger generation, their offspring. That's what they believe the Lord had called them and convicted them and empowered them to do. Pray for the Spirit of the, of the Lord to be poured out on their offspring. Now, you know, up yonder, Hebrews 12, that great cloud of witnesses, somewhere up there, there are those two ladies. Somewhere up there, their prayer, Lord, we, have, we, have, we were led to remind you of your heart to pour out your Spirit on our offspring. And look way down yonder. There's Donald. We didn't even know him. We, 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 didn't, we didn't have any connection with him, but he has become, he is a part of our offspring. And Lord, you have instructed us to pray. You would pour out your Spirit on our offspring. Now, I'm saying that, folks. Because there's some of us as grandparents and some of us as parents that are going to sleep at the wheel. Prayers never die. Prayers never die. The Lord lives in the eternal present tense. What was, what was vivid in Eden, he still, it's vivid to him now. What, what was vivid in the 18, 1950s and the Hebrides revival, it's true now. His prayers never die. Folks. What if you were here on this earth with the babies God's given you, the family line he's given you, and it is your role. You can't pass it off to some preacher or some professional clergy. It's your role. Come, kingdom of God, to my babies. Come, presence of Jesus. I'm not going to be content with us just going, and going to church and being in vacation Bible school. I want them to know you. I want them to know you. And I won't shut up, and I won't let up until there is the sense of your presence working and living and throbbing and holding them. Come, kingdom of God, be done, will of God, on this earth. The prayers of those two sisters, those two great aunts, long gone could be having direct effect now in the life of this one of their offspring when that fella pointed that scoped rifle at his head and missed him by a quarter of an inch or a half inch that could have ended his life. Their prayer had been, Lord, send your favor, send your blessing upon thy offspring. It is, is being protected from a head wound a blessing or not? Blessed with favor. Folks, somehow they either hate him or they love him. All I'm saying is, he's not the Messiah, but I believe that he very well could be the object of the prayers of folks who, have dead, who, who died a long time ago, and God's still answering them right now. You be that daddy, that granddaddy, that grandmother, that aunt, that uncle, that person at work. 
If Jesus didn't mean it, why did he say it? Here's how you pray. Come, kingdom of God. Oh, oh, no, Lord, will you just, will you please, will you please help me? No. You're my child. I washed you in my blood. I've raised you up and you're seated in the heavenly places with me. You call down my kingdom. You call down my will. Not your will, but my will. You want what I want and you watch what happens. It, it's a, it, is a, it is a striking call to prayer. You, we can get so busy doing other stuff, we can spend all our hours watching sports or watching the news, and where is the time spent saying, Lord, my, my babies need you, my family needs you, my co-workers need you, come kingdom of God. Kingdom of God is the presence of the king, the pleasure of the king being worked in and manifest, and the power of the king, the power of the king. Yes. We've said that so many times that it just, we just kind of go to sleep when we say it. There's no power in vain repetition. No power. Just, just don't even do it. But when the Spirit of the Lord makes that real to you, he has given you that assignment as, that, as a joint heir with him on this earth. He's up there. We're still down here. You speak it. The kingdom of God, I heard a preacher say just a few days ago, the kingdom of God is voice activated. The kingdom of God is voice activated. If we just think it, but we never say it. There's power in your words. Say it, not. All right. I need to move on from there. But, the, but there, are, there are many of us that need to cut that down deep within us. It needs to be something that animates us, animates us. When we hear of a struggle, when we hear of something going on in the lives of someone they love, someone kin to us, someone that we care about, in, instead of just blowing it off, why did we hear that? Why do we know that? Kingdom of God come, presence of Jesus. You're the healer of broken hearts. Make your presence known to heal that broken heart. Seeking wisdom. Lord, there's nothing you don't know. There's all, you have all wisdom. You, you have all knowledge. Speak to that. Cause them to know what they need to know. Okay. The coming outpouring. The coming outpouring. In Isaiah, that, that statement, I will pour out my water, I'll pour out water on the thirsty land, streams on the dry ground, I'll pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. I'll pour out water on the thirsty. I'll pour out water on the thirsty. What, what is causing you to be thirsty for a divine intervention? In your family, in your health, that, that, that's why millions of believers had, had gathered to pray or praying, praying quietly or linked up online. The, the condition of the nation, the direction that we've been headed caused us to be thirsty for God to intervene. And this scripture says that where there are thirsty people, where they're thirsty, I will pour out my spirit. I want you to leave that Isaiah 43. Know that that's there, but go with me to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. John the Baptist is speaking. He gives one way of knowing that you have encountered the Messiah. One way of knowing that the Messiah is in your presence. He was speaking of Jesus, but he gave this only one sign, only one indication. Verse 11, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, and fire. He will baptize you. That is not a metaphorical term. That's not some mental game. He could use another word. Baptize means to drench, to soak, to thoroughly submerge. 
It, it won't be something you can miss if it happens to you. You, you. you can't say, I've experienced this, and you felt nothing. Can't say it any more than you can stick your hand and sleeve into a vat of water and pick it back up out and hold it up and say, I don't feel a thing. Well, you're paralyzed or something's wrong with you. Becoming outpouring, I believe, is going to be the Spirit being poured out upon the thirsty followers of Jesus in America who are asking the Lord, seeking the Lord, that he would freshly, if it has never happened before for the first time, but again if you've known it before, but it has diminished, freshly baptize me with your spirit. That's the sense of your presence. And with fire, that's power. That's power. You say, that's just, that's just got to be for the super spiritual or the ones that are too old to be involved in anything else. I'm saying to you, no. I believe there are millions, millions of ordinary folks just like us that were drawn because of a thirst for the nation. But once we realize that we're, we're praying in the direction for an election, that for your will to be done there, we're realizing that if something doesn't happen in the soul of the nation, we won't necessarily be any better off four years from now than we would be right now. It's about the Spirit of God doing a work in the hearts of people. So, so... D does that mean that folks we don't have any contact with, we are still responsible for, or we have some obligation to? I would say no. No. But what we do have responsibility for is in the place of the opportunities the Lord has given us. You look out across your concentric circles of influence and relationship. You, you know, you may know somebody in Washington, but I guarantee you, you know a bunch of people in San Antonio or Bear County, and you can be burdened for them. You realize that marriages are, they may come apart. It looks, the, the direction is wrong. It, children stray and running off, it, it, different thing, things like that that are humanly impossible to fix. But you begin to pray because of the thirst for them to be changed, for the difference to be made. You begin to pray, Lord, whatever it means, baptize me, drench me all over again with your presence and with fire. <laughs> Folks, that's not supposed to be just some unique, somebody who's been to Bible college. John was saying that to everybody who would know of Jesus, everybody. everybody. Here's how you'll know that you've met him, he will drench you with his spirit. That's his presence. That's the sense of his presence. So, so that there's a very real sense in which you feel like he talks to you, that he speaks to you, that you have a sense, and Paul would say, we have the mind of Christ. There are some things that used to just be all you, but now there can be a sense that, that there is a sense of direction. There is a sense of purpose. There is a sense of loving people when you didn't used to care about anybody. The sense of his presence. Baptize me, Lord, with the sense of your presence. I want to dare you. I want to challenge you. Don't be satisfied with just coming to church and not feeling anything. And say, I checked my box. That's all that God is. No, that's not all he is. He wants you to feel his presence. That's why the Spirit has been given. As we've said, if the Spirit had not been poured out on the day of Pentecost for, for the church to be filled with his presence, and those, all we would have continued to have is just copies of Scripture. That that's all I'm to know of him. All I'll ever know of him is what I can read about him. No, he said, I don't want you just to read about me. I want you to know me. I want you to feel me. I want you to have, have fellowship with me. You say, well, I'm, I'm real busy. You, well, you're too busy. You know, I, I, I got, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not all that spiritual. Well, get spiritual. If you want to know power, if you want to know it, making a difference in the society around you, the culture around you, it will be because he, by his spirit, has drenched you with the sense of his presence, and he's giving you power to accomplish that witness in his name.
So, so, leave, leave there and go to Acts chapter 1, and I, I, I know we're liable to, don't, don't worry, we'll, we'll get out of here, I promise, before the Methodist gets get to Applebee's. <clears throat> Jesus is speaking in Acts chapter 1 to a group of people who understood that he died on the cross for their sins. They knew where he was buried, and now they see him standing before them, speaking to them. He was raised from the dead. That's what it takes to make it from Bear County to heaven, that you have received Jesus as your Savior. This is, Philipp, uh, this is 1 Corinthians 15. You believe that he, he died for your sins, he was buried, and he was raised again on the third day. That, that's, that's, that's embracing the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ in its core. But Jesus, knowing that they knew that about him, he continued to teach on the subject of the kingdom of God, which would be the presence of the king, the pleasure of the king, the power of the king being manifest. And he's saying, you don't have the power of the kingdom yet. You're going to heaven when you die, but you don't have power. John says, this is how you'll know. This is how you know you will have met the master, the, the Messiah, in the fullness of who he is. He will baptize you in his spirit, and he will baptize you with fire. So Jesus will say in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost part of the earth. Here's, here's where I'm trying to get, folks. There are folks, and I think there are millions of followers of Jesus, we can look at ourselves and we can realize church religious motions have no power. Even being around all kinds of a bunch of other good things, no power. But Lord, whatever this means, whatever this means, that you want to drench me with the sense of your presence and you want to drench me with your fire, I want that. I'm not going to settle with just another discipleship class. I'm not going to settle with just some, another Christian friend having coffee. Whatever this means, baptize me with your spirit and with fire so that I can be the example, I can be the witness that you will empower me to be to the folks whose names I know, whose burdens I understand who live in the geographic area that I can get to. I'm just saying to you, there was a stirring in the hearts of the people of God, which is a precursor, I believe, for a major outpouring of the Spirit when He answers that prayer for His people. I'm sending a fresh baptism of my Spirit I am sending a fresh baptism of my fire. And I'm just saying to all of us, don't be left in the grandstand. Don't be left watching it. Because you may never have prayed, Lord, I don't even know what that means. But I do know I'm scared to share my faith in you. I, I, I know that there are things that, that, that really bother me, can push me back by people. So whatever it is, Lord, I'm just asking you, that's what I'll encourage you. Baptize me. It's a right that you have as one who's received Jesus as Savior, Lord. Baptize me with your spirit and with fire. You, you, you get, you, so, so what does that fire mean? I, I, Acts chapter 4, can, I, I got to shut this down here pretty quick, but Acts chapter 4, go, the day of Pentecost happened, ordinary people, ordinary people, ordinary men and women being drenched with the sense of the presence of Jesus, 
and with power to be able to speak as a witness of Jesus. They were threatened. They were shut down. They were pushed back. Peter and John and the others gather. This is Acts chapter 4. Notice how they prayed. Verse 29, and now, Lord, take note of their threats. And this is, this is one request they made. Grant that thy bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. Give us boldness back. Give us boldness back to represent you. And then they say this. While you extend your hand to heal, and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Then it says, the next verse down, and all were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. All right, so fill me with boldness, Lord, to speak the name Jesus. You can invite them to church all day long. You can invite them to Alamo City all day long, and nothing will change in their hearts. But you speak Jesus, and you speak of his love to them, and you speak he died on the cross. He was buried, raised again on the third day. Receive him. Receive Jesus. And that's the gospel. It's the power of God to save. But also... Ask for signs and wonders to confirm what you've said to them. Now, you're looking at me kind of funny, and that's okay. But you know some folks that you could say Jesus all day, and they'd be nice to you. But if they were still, if they're still losing their eyesight, or they still had a son that had left, or their marriage was in major crisis, or there was something going wrong in their business. But if, on the other hand, you just flat out pray, Lord, bring John back. In the name of Jesus, I'm asking you, Lord, to do what you need to do to fix this business, fix this income, fix this situation. (laughs) Sign and wonder, sign and wonder, sign and wonder, sign and wonder. All the way through the book of Acts. That's how things would explode in cities. There was a demon-possessed girl who was giving the ability to tell the future of folks, and and, and she was a slave, and these men owned her. her. Paul, Paul cast the demon out in the name of Jesus. Leave her alone. She got set free. Well, they got in all kinds of trouble for that because that was their men's the men's way of making money. But again and again, it would be healing. It would be a sign and a wonder is something that God does that only God could do that would prove to that one who's had a hard time believing that there must be something going on here. I want to encourage you. When you pray, Lord, fill me with your spirit, fresh baptism of your spirit, and you begin to try to live in that way and follow his promptings, you're going to be in some situations walking down the Walmart grocery section, cereal section. And you see somebody down there. Something in your heart just goes there. You go with that fire. You go with that fire. You walk up, and you you won't be plastering with a 40-pound Bible, and you won't be doing all kinds of religious things, but it may just be that that you're able to say to them, I I noticed you. How you doing? You don't know them from Adam. They don't know you. But the spirit of Jesus in you is working on their spirit, and somehow you would be given the ability to, I just want to encourage you. Could I just pray for you? Could I just pray for you? You say, well, I don't know if I can get all my words right in praying. You just start, and he'll fill in the blanks. I dare you. I dare you. Someone say, I'm brave, I'm brave, I'm brave, but too scared to open your mouth in prayer. Huh? Okay. Real let in. I'm saying, I believe there is an outpouring coming, and it will be as ordinary people, just like you and me, are freshly baptized, filled with His Spirit, His presence, and power. Power to speak His name, and power to look to Him for signs and wonders to confirm what you've said in that life. Don't be afraid to go there. Now, we're going to finish with this clip that just 
blessed me. Fox News. I don't ever think, it, you know, get blessed by everything on Fox News. But this one, a few weeks ago, this is a businessman who had lost 80 buildings in the flood in North Carolina. Trump is there. I have this gathering. This businessman is asked to say something, and then he asks if he could pray for Trump. He didn't have any way to prepare for this. He didn't even know if Trump would be there, if they'd let him on the way. He didn't know any of that. It's the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit. Having baptized him with the sense of the presence of Jesus and giving to him the power to say the things in agreement with heaven's heart for the one who would be the next president-elect of our nation. I want you to watch this. And Mike Stewart, the owner of Pine View Buildings, is here. Mike? Mike, please. How are you? Thank you. Good job. Yeah, we, uh, we had a business right across the street, like with the Swannanoa River flowing on the backside of it, and uh, we lost everything. We had 70-plus buildings, and we drove here two days later, and there wasn't one building that was ours, but there were houses and trailers and tankers and all sorts of things that were strewn across our property. And we lost a business, but there are a lot of people who, who lost everything, including loved ones. And I believe that you can serve as a great inspiration to this community right now. And the reason being is I think God's given you an indomitable spirit. And no matter what gets thrown at you, um, you find a way to press through. And I think that'll serve as an inspiration to this community to press on and move forward. Um, I can't think of anything I'd rather have than a, a warrior leading our country, a warrior who, with the help of God and with faith and prayer, will lead this community, these communities, and this country uh, to greatness. So thank you for being here today. Thank you. Come here, come here. I never heard anything. And it, it, that was from the heart. No speechwriter could write that, 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 right? If you don't mind, just because my heart's yes. about to be, do you mind if I pray for you? Yes, please. Okay, so, and all those of you that are prayers, would you join with me in this prayer? Father, I thank you for this man that you have raised up in this moment, in this season, for your purposes. And I pray that you would anoint him, that things aren't done just by might or by power, yes. but by your spirit. So I ask that you would anoint President Donald Trump and give him a spirit of wisdom and understanding and insight as he moves to lead this nation back to greatness. In Jesus' name I pray. Just stand with me, please. That could be you. That could be you. The Lord puts you in a position. He gives you an opportunity. And I'm going to empower you to bear witness of me. There's no doubt, as that man spoke, that his heart belonged to Jesus and his trust was in Jesus. He prayed in the name of Jesus, but then he wasn't reading a written out prayer. The Lord was giving to him as he spoke the things that the Lord wanted him to say. He may have thought some ahead of time if he had a chance. I believe the Lord is saying to many that are listening to me today, I'm going to call you higher. I'm calling you higher in my authority, in my power. As you go low in your submission, your honoring of me. I'll raise you up as I can trust you to do what I give you to do. It doesn't matter if it ever happens in a church building. Where you are, he is. And he has put you there, knowing the people you know, all of that. And in that setting, 
He wants to baptize you with his spirit and with fire. Please let that in. Please let that in. Please let that in. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for what you are doing in our nation. Thank you for what you are doing in the hearts of followers of Jesus, your bride. May we be keenly aware of your instruction and warmly drawn to believe you for what you say we can have. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Our prayer partners will be at these crosses on these sides. If we can pray with you, that's what we want to do. If, now please don't leave here thinking nobody cared. We, we can't know unless you let us know, and we, we want to respond to that, and we will. And we're going to sing with Jillian, turn your eyes upon Jesus. But I, we, we would sing that some years ago, and it was... Maybe it was the Jesus, the gentle shepherd, Jesus, the, you know, the, on the cross, or, but, but that's not, he's not there anymore. He's the exalted king. He's the captain of the angel armies. He's the Lord of all creation. He's the Lord. So when we turn our eyes on Jesus, we're not turning our eyes on the weak Jesus. <laughs> we're putting our eyes on the king Jesus. Amen. Amen. Turn.